is a, is a new lab, so even for the mentors, you guys won't have seen this from last year. Um, but Noah and I thought it was important to demonstrate before we get into, deep we get into Socrata next week, um, what some of the other data portals throughout New York City offer, especially in terms of the amount of information and the types of information you can find out about particular buildings in the city. Okay, So that's sort of the overall premise of this of today's work. So it's going to be good because you're going to start getting into the nitty-gritty aspects of what kind of data is available. And this will kind of frame and inform you know, your work over the course of the year because you'll know of these repositories of data that you probably don't know about yet. And that's part of you know, what our overall mission and questions that have already come up have been about in that people have said, well, it's great that there's this data available, but you know, who even knows that it exists? And um, you know, that's an obstacle that this group um, and people in our community face in order to try to um, y you know, make as best and make the highest and best use of all the data that's available, people need to know about it. So this is part of that um, process. And um, hopefully, you know, the word will just be spread um, over time and people will start to understand where they can find this information, some of which may be very important for them in one reason or another, and they may have had no idea that they could have found it. Um, I experienced this when I was doing my research in Crown Heights, um, the community organization that I worked with. I, I actually sort of showed some of this stuff to, and they were, you know, you know they're 60 plus in age, and um, they just didn't know, and it was helpful for them. So, you know, this is all part of that process. So, um, does this make sense so far? Yes? So, um, sort of just more broadly speaking, sort of the theory of this whole lab, I guess, we could say, you know, in terms of um, the fact that it's geography-based and building-based, you want to start thinking about how you, every step and every place you are in the city over the course of your day, you're somewhere. And you're um, somewhere where there's so much that's sort of in, you know, kind of informing where you are at that particular moment. Um, so many um, things to learn about any location. So behind every building in New York City, there is so much data, and there are so many stories, especially in our historical buildings, um, like this one that we were just talking about. I mean, think about 102 years, you know, just think about how much there is about this building that one could learn. So today's lab will introduce you to several portals of information about buildings throughout the city. So we're going to start with something called GOAT. Um, and uh, there's some other important data sources out there called Tiger and called Lion. So I think there's some sort of, you know, interest in animal acronyms in general in the world of data. But OK, that's a tangent. <laughs> so GOAT is the Geographic Online Address Translator. So the very first thing you guys are going to need to do for the lab is pick a property. Pick an address in the city that you're interested in. And that could be your home. That could be your a school building that you've gone to. It could be a restaurant that you like, a building that you've been curious about. It could be a decaying building that you've seen. It could be a skyscraper, whatever you want. It's got to be in the five boroughs, though. So when you start the lab, the first technical work that we do is go into GOAT. Um, now, if I click this, just trying to think, should we go to the hosting slash? Oh, oops. Okay. Never mind. We don't know. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. So, this is what you're going to go to when you go to GOAT. Um, and essentially, um, as I said, you're going to have picked a building. So, you, th the GOAT. Um, works in a, you, you, you input your address in this parsed way. So borough, the number, which would be the, just the number of whatever street it's on, and then the street or name here. And um, you will be taken to um, a portal of information about your building. Um, you can notice here at the top that there's actually different ways you could search. So um, if you didn't know the exact number, like, say you remember there's this interesting decaying building uh, that you've seen before, but you don't know the number of it. You can search for it in other ways, through an intersection, 
um, mm -hmm. through a blocking lot bin or um, or just a street um, I'm not even sure how that would work exactly but anyway but I think for the most part we're going to be using address um, but since I mentioned blocking lot and bin let's talk about that okay um, So block and lot and bin. Um, who knows what block and lot and bin are? Anybody? Well, okay, let's exclude the mentors for a minute. Because the mentors all know at this point? No. None of you guys know. Okay. Awesome. So, and any of the fellows know? Martin? <laughs> no? Um, okay. So these are some these are some very important concepts to understand uh, for anyone doing research in New York City, particularly about the our urban fabric in our built environment. So we'll start with block and lot. Um, let's talk for a minute about an address. So um, basically, uh, I live right now 322 East 11th Street. Could you imagine someone maybe referring to that as 322 11th Street in the East Village? Right, like they could just kind of forget, just put the east there. Address data is notoriously a little ambiguous. Okay, someone else, maybe my building is on a corner and maybe people refer to it as, maybe it has another name on Second Avenue. So, or it could have a stretch of numbers, 227 to 229. There's a lot of reasons that people could misspell the name of the street or forget the east or put an E period instead of East 11th Street. Address data is notoriously kind of messy and subject to sort of human interpretation and human subjectivity. So block and lot is the kind of information that locates a building in a extremely precise and in an extremely precise way where there is no room for ambiguity. And this is the reason that a block and lot is extremely important when you are trying to precisely locate a building in New York. So block and lot refers to, uh, those are two pieces of information that identify the parcel that the building is on. So I should make a point here that um, it's not, block and lot does not refer to a particular building per se. It refers to the tax lot that the building is on, the parcel that the building is on, okay? So say a building um, is destroyed over time through fire and a new one is built, that building is gonna have the same block and lot as the previous building because it's on the same parcel of land. Um, so, um, yeah, okay. So. Block and lots were actually created for New York City like way back in the like feudal era when people were trying to identify lots of land in a systematic way. So, um, so, uh, so yeah. So they've been around for a long time, but um, today. So this is a picture from the 1940s. Okay. Um, in the 1940s, um, to in order to put some people back to work after the Great Depression, uh, New York City launched a, a photographic survey of every single building or parcel in the city in all five boroughs. So they sent hundreds of people to work who'd been unemployed, especially sort of design types, architects, who had no work during the Great Depression because no work was being done. So the city was at a standstill in terms of development. Um, and put these people back to work by giving them this big project called, um, it was called the Historic Tax, well now it's called the Historic Tax, but I guess it wasn't called Historic back then when it was first created, but whatever it was called back then. Um, and basically every single building in the city was, was photographed. So this is a building in Greenpoint where Noel lives, um, and um, uh, these buildings were identified not by their address because again the address data is a little messy street names change over time it was identified by its block and lot okay so here we have 2522 is its block 56 is its lot and BK stands for the borough of Brooklyn 
Okay. I'm, um, so, uh, so that's essentially, we're going to get more specific about this in the next slide or two. But at this point, does anyone have any questions about this block and lot situation? No? It's clear? Okay. So this comes from um, the city government website about a block and lot. Um, so each property in New York City is identified by a set of three numbers called the borough block and lot. Okay, so actually that borough number is, is attached to it as well. And as a number, as a, as, a, as, a, as, as a single number, when you bring all three together, when you concatenate them, which we'll talk about at another point, it's referred to as a BBL, borough block and lot. And this is used by many city agencies to identify real estate information for taxes, zoning, construction, and other purposes, to identify them in a very precise way. So the borough number always comes first. Manhattan is first, even though alphabetically that doesn't follow. <laughs> I guess that's kind of to expect that, right? Um, and, um, and these are the numbers for the, for the five boroughs. And then the block number, um, is going to be a five-digit number, and the lot number is going to be a four-digit number. Now, let's go back to this. You might say, hey, I don't see a five-digit number and a four-digit number. Uh, so the BK would be three, because Bro Brooklyn's number is three. Um, can anyone think as to why, what, what, what's going on here with this five-digit and four-digit? That's what this page says. It says the block number is second, which is this number, because the BK is last year. Why, it says it's up to five digits. So what, what's, if it's a five digit number and this is a four digit number, um, what do you think is going on? What do you think might be going on there? Okay, is I have to trade for the front of it somewhere. Okay, just hold on. Um, it's probably a zero. Wh what do I hear here? There's a zero, like it's There's zero, a two, five, six, seven. Great, there's a zero. <coughs> Perfect, thank you. So, um, so, so let's play with this number here. So our, it says here that the borough number is always first, right? Three. And what's our borough number? Three. three. Okay, so we're gonna put our three <coughs> first. Okay, now Isaac, what's, okay, then it says the block number is second and it's up to five digits. So what goes next? Zero, two, five, two, two. Zero, two, five, two, two. Okay. The lot number is last and it's going to be up to four digits, so what do we get? Zero, zero, five, two. Okay. So, are you telling me that this is that number, that building's BBL? Well, maybe not, because not? it says can be up to okay. four or five. Okay. What about, what about you, Martin? What do you think? Are you a little confused? It's a little confusing. Believe it's me, a it's, a, it's a hard concept to find. You'll get it can later. Can dash here? Because it's, yeah. You think there's no. a dash? Okay. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna you're gonna see this later. This is seriously a, a concept that like most people still don't even know to this day, and you guys are in college, so um, so it's it, you're you're doing great. But basically, the bottom line is that actually, Isaac, you are completely right. Oh, cool. This is that building's BBL <coughs> that will uniquely identify it, and no other building in the city or no other parcel in the city will have this. Okay. So um, you'll have much more practice with that thing later, but okay. So the concept of a BBL is actually so important that um, it has its own lookup tool. So um, we're going to go to this for a second. So this is put out put out by the city of New York, um, and it enables you specifically t for you to put in an address and get the. Um, get the block and lot. So let me give you my address. And and okay, and what do we notice? This is interesting, right? We notice here here it gives it to us, but actually that's kinda like I would com I should like put a complaint in. They should really <laughs> how should they write this number in uh, based on what we just talked about? Okay, so what would that be, Shri? One, one. What is it? Okay, then what? Great. There we go. So that is that apart that apartment building's BBL. Okay. And um, so, how many digits is a BBL in total? Ten. Ten. It's a ten-digit number. 
Um, okay, so we covered block and lot. Now there's something else. Bin? Yes. Um, a bin is to uniquely identify the building. So say you have a parcel with two or three buildings on it. Bin then identifies the building itself. Mm -hmm. um, and people use bin way less, I think, under my understanding at least. Um, like I've hardly ever used bin. Maybe that's, maybe that's my bad. Um, so maybe I shouldn't say this. But anyway, the bin is also available to you. Um, I don't, and that's just assigned by the Department of City Planning. Um, so anyway, uh, you can always look it up, but I'm not sure if there's such a systematic way to generate it yourself. Probably, probably not. Um, but you can always look it up. Okay, so those are two pieces of information you're gonna find in GOAT, which is that first um, portal that you'll go to. You're also gonna find in GOAT um, a lot of administrative boundaries. So say you're speaking about a specific building. Well, that building exists within a borough. It exists within a community district. It exists within a police pre precinct. It exists within a census tract, a city council district, an assembly district, a congressional district. It goes on and on and on and on and on. So we wanted you to become cognizant of these boundaries when you're thinking about a building because it doesn't just exist in and of itself in the city as a whole. It has all these other sort of unique places that it exists within that actually you know, impact what's going on there. Okay, so our next portal of information, we're done with GOAT, is New York City map. So this is quite a bit different from GOAT um, because it's, uh, it's a map, an interactive map. So um, when you plug in your building um, here, it's actually not sort of parsed like it was in that other, in GOAT. So um, if I plug in this, you know, it doesn't have a place to, it doesn't have a menu, it's a little drop down menu for the borough, right? So say I just look for it, I get a little error here that says, do you mean Brooklyn or New York, Manhattan? So it's kind of more flexible, this search bar here, but anyway. So once you get to, once you go, it's going to give you a map of your parcel, it's going to highlight it, um, or of your building footprint, and give you a lot of information about that building on the right-hand side. And uh, we're going to ask you to find out some pieces of information in the lab through that portal. Um, okay. So the next one we want to go to is, um, the next portal is called BIS. Uh, so, oh, just a quick note that GOAT and New York City Map are both hosted by the Department of City Planning. BIS is an information system that is hosted by the Department of Buildings. Um, so uh, BIS, since it's a different department, it has different interests than Department of City Planning, so it's going to have different information in it. Um, so uh, when you go to BIS, um, it looks like this. Now, when you notice, you can notice here that you can search for it by address. Um, you could also search for it by block and lot, um, or by bin, actually. So, but I think for the most part, people are going to stick with searching it by address. Um, and then once you get into it, you're going to find a lot of information that you haven't seen yet because it's particular to, the, to information that the Department of Buildings needs to know. Those are things like violations on buildings, permits being issued, complaints on them, landmark status. Yeah. So you know, um, before we were on the GOAT and we could look at the building and there was a bin number, but it wasn't in the format that we expected to see it. Mm -hmm. Let's say I would enter the same exact on this website, would it give, would it give me the results? Uh, compared to, let's say, we added all the zeros and then... Oh, great question. Okay, let's, let's check it out. Okay, so here, that's a great question, Martin. Wow. So here, it doesn't give us the BBL in this form. It gives right. it to us as a separate block and lot and without those leading zeros. So you guys just need to kind of always keep in mind that the, the block is a five digit number and the lot is a four digit number. So if it's two digits, there's two leading zeros and blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Can we do community board 
boards know about this website? This, um, do the community boards? Yeah, I think I think someone, yes, in Manhattan, people on the community boards will know about this. Um, but for instance, in the community organization that I worked with, they actually really weren't that familiar with this. Um, and they found it very interesting that they could, that, and this was just in 2014. Maybe, maybe it's changed by then. I mean, this world of data and tech is really, you know, it's at a quick pace. So who knows at this moment, but at the time that I was there in 2014, the people I was working with actually weren't really aware so much. I mean, maybe one person was, but not really that you could like systematically look up all these violations. Um, so I don't know what the case is right now in community boards in Manhattan. My instinct would be that they know about this, but but I, but you guys could totally be wrong on that one. I don't know. Um, so you're going to go through and document some of these, some of this information about the building that you s that you choose for this lab. So yes, yeah, so you use BIS to learn if the building has um, Department of Building and Environmental Control Board violations, permits, complaints, and much more. Okay, and this is the kind of information that's really useful to an agency like the Department of Building. Um, okay, so these aren't particular New York City portals per se, but um, they're also, you know, think about them as such because th they are. They offer a ton more of information you can find out about your, about any building. So um, I'm sure people have been to Google Maps a million times, but you'll go to it in this lab as well. And um, so, oh, this is where Noel works. Um, and um, basically, so when you go to Google Maps, um, I mean, you guys have done this a million times, I'm sure, but you know, think about what kinds of information you get from Google Maps about a building that you don't from some of these other places. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to ask you to write a little bit about that. Um, and then, of course, there's Street View, which you get to, you can get to by clicking the image there. Can I point out a particular part of the street view? So in the upper left-hand corner, if you yeah. still look at the screen, you see where it says street view, October 2014? Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you click on that, you can actually travel through time. You can time travel mm -hmm. through Google Maps. Oh, that's awesome. um, and so if you can, uh, Emily, just you know slide through all of the wow. different street views. And so what's interesting to see in the street view one of the fellows last year um, came upon a place that had a lot of uh, noise complaints uh, in Freeman One. And you could go back in time, and for every Street View year, there was actually a different business in that particular location. Mm -hmm. And so you could see high turnover of a particular business. And that could be poor management, that could be you know, a, number of, uh, a, a, number, a number of other mm -hmm. quality of life indicators. Um, that place also had a lot of sanitation and rodent complaints. And so you can see, you know, like this is just, <coughs> it's street view and it's historic street view, but not only do you see condition of the building, but you can also see at times what building or what business happens to be there. Um, and so it gives just a little bit more a visual context than, um, than if you were just looking at a photo or go there today. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Noel. Yeah, that I is, this I is, mean, this is some every two years? N not necessarily every two years. It's sort of. I don't know the frequency of, of what they're uh, capturing, but it's uh, it can be as frequent as every other year, so every two years. And in my neighborhood, um, it's been like every year. Like they'll, they'll still have a car come through. You've seen the vehicles pass by. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I can go to Street View and I can see the history and see 20, 2014, uh, 2015. And so. Some places on Earth have not yet been mapped at all by Street View, though. Um, and, and some places have been mapped, just want photographed just once because they're hard to reach. But in a city like New York, you're going to get it a lot. Um, but that's, you know, that'll be interesting to see how many. Actually, yeah, we didn't put that in the lab, but um, that would be a great question, how many historical images there are. Um, maybe I'll edit the lab real quick before you guys get into it, because that's I think that's a, a really, this, that is a just a, a wealth of, of information there. I mean, I'm really glad you brought that up, Noel, because, you know, seriously, like this is, you know, so extraordinary to have access to this kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah. 
and it'll be interesting to see different boroughs how much they have. So, um, yeah, so, right. So Google Maps and Google Sheets are huge data repositories. Um, how much data does Google Maps have? Well, in 2012, which is going to be seriously outdated, I just grabbed this from, a, from the first site I came to, practically. Um, you know, it had over 20 petabytes of data. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means. It sounds like a lot. Um, and this size would keep increasing at a high rate because of the Street View team has been constantly taking constantly taking photos, um, which uh, for uh, you know ever since then. Um, and uh, that's an example of a <coughs> funny Street View vehicle with that 15 lens camera. And that's why the images are so high quality, 65 mm -hmm. pixels. Yeah. Um, that's your kind of different visual uh, application side of it. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a fun summer <laughs> job. Yeah, you're right. That would be awesome. You'd get to go see the world. Well, speaking of, speaking of seeing the world, um, this is a really cool art project. I actually met this person who created this project um, randomly at Cornell a couple years ago. Um, he created this fascinating um, art project called Nine Eyes where he s trolled um, Google Street View and kind of curated the most stunning images um, that he found. And this is one of them. Um, we can go to it real quick just for fun. That's actually the first <coughs> image, but I mean, there's some really kind of unbelievable things <laughs> are captured in Google Street View. Um, look at this one. There's like two twins just walking. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of creepy, right? Um, you know, but there's... Um, and anyway, so you guys can go to this site if you want and check it out. It's, it's pretty stunning. Um, he actually got a lot of press about this project. Nine Eyes, yeah. Oh, I'm glad you guys like that. Um, okay, so moving on. We only we have two more portals to talk about today. Um, Acris, so, okay, so which city agencies have we looked at their data portals so far? Building and city planning. Great. So we also are going to look at one that's from the Department of Finance. Um, so what do you think the Department of Finance is, what kind of information might the Department of Finance have about the buildings? Maybe, yep. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll go to Acris real quick. So you're going to find, you're going to, um, actually, I'm not going to do this for you because you're going to do it in the lab. Um, so, um, but Acris will eventually get you to a place where you can look at um, this financial information about your parcel. Uh, so things like uh, mortgages, deeds, uh, the companies involved in the transactions. Um, so not quite the value, you know, not the value. That you can, there's actually another website uh, for that. Um, I mean, this is just a sample of mm -hmm. some of them. There's way more places to look for information than <coughs> we're even showing you today. Because it'd be too much to try to do all of them, probably. Um, but, or we could expand it and at some point do more. But at this point, we don't take you to that site, but we do take you here. So, um, yeah. So, and this is just, you know, freely available, you know, to the public, and I don't know if people really look at this so much. Um, I think this was another place where um, it's, it's a little bit, like, cloaked, you know, that this database exists and stuff. Um, okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about is census data. You guys have all heard me get a little excited about census data in the past. Um, that's because I had to, like, kill myself for like six months of trying to figure out various aspects of census stuff for my own research and dissertation. So anyway, so census data is the country's main source of demographic and socioeconomic information about the American people. Um, it's really the only place where you can find, you know, these this kind of data about about American communities that are um, that is, you know, as accurate as it as we can make it. 
Um, most countries have some form of census data, um, but some countries' census data is like not considered reliable by researchers and policy analysts and stuff, so they don't even really bother trying to make to trying to analyze it that intensively. Um, whereas in the <coughs> U.S., it's considered extremely accurate. You know, at least that's what the general point of view is about census data. So it informs a lot of decision making. Um, so, like my best friend from Cornell um, works in her research is in India, and um, she's just like, yeah, sense data, forget it. Like, there's, it's, it's, it's not like you can't use it in a in a reliable way. Whereas I made like a ton of, you know, in, I made a, a big to do about using census data because it is supposed to be quite accurate. And I was my research was in Brooklyn. Um, okay. So um, the first census was taken in 1790 um, uh, to count the population and for congressional reapportionment. So, okay, so I click this to this because, um, I link this to this because the word census actually means a count. Okay, so that's why we call it a census because it, it's an official count, especially of a population. Um, so, you can imagine that, it's, that a, 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 country, a new country needs, wants to know how many people live in that country, right? So, that's why the census was undertaken. And it was taken for congressional reapportionment because in our system, in our uh, way of government, um, each state sends two representatives to Senate. to the Senate. Thank you. <laughs> um, and each state sends a certain number of representatives to the House, house yeah. based on its population. So we not only needed to know the population of the country as a whole, but the population of every state, so we could determine how many representatives were going to go to the House of Representatives. Um, so, um, so, so that's why the, the first census was undertaken in 1790. And it was very simple compared to what it is now and what you'll see when you guys get into the portals of information for census data, uh, you'll see how much information there is now. But back then, it was these four questions. Um, and um, I believe slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person when they did a count, which is like, you know, a obviously horrible racist legacy um, that, you know, is just part of the America's past, um, but mainly they were interested in the free white males because uh, that's how I think they made these apportionment um, decisions. Yeah, I think you have a question. Yeah, just generally, I'm wondering how do researchers who depend on census data like you, what do you guys do about the fact that the racial categories change just about every time, mm -hmm. like the Hispanics come up, and then even the way they like will determine who's African-American. They went from like somebody going door to door and categorizing you to you doing it yourself. So uh, do, is there any way to work around or, or do you guys just say like, the categories change, I have nothing to write here. No, that's, that's, an, that's a really wonderful question. Um, at every census, there is like a lot of technical documentation and metadata and things like this that are released with each census so that researchers can describe um, ex you know, in detail under what conditions they are working under in terms of making these decisions about saying things about race, for instance. So, um, but researchers are, are, you know, have to rely on, on what's provided, you know? So you just have to make, you just have to understand it yourself, what you're saying, you know, and not say, you know, if you're if you're talking about, you know, white white people, fine, but make sure you say, you know, that it's non-Hispanic or whatever it is. You know, you have to, like, really understand what you're saying before you put it out there in a paper or something like that, you know? And for that, you do have to look at all this documentation about that particular census because, yes, the questions change every time, pretty much, um, or the categories change. Um, so, yeah, so it's up to the researcher to really understand what he or she is saying before putting it out there. Um, but
but but we are but as you know but researchers are just subject to whatever um, whatever the census whatever decisions the census has made that year you know we can't change it ourselves we just have to know what we're talking about does that make, that make sense okay um, so okay this is a little complicated but not too bad I don't think um, so um, prior to 2005 the census the methodology of the census was that there was a short form and a long form. The short form um, was all the basic, was, was a questionnaire that was, was sent to, in theory, every single household in the country. The short form was considered a full count, okay? A full count of the American household and is supposed to be as close to 100% accurate as absolutely possible. Um, so, uh, this questionnaire that was sent to every single household, because it was sent to every single household, um, was short because, uh, they wanted, you know, the right answers or they wanted as close to accuracy as they could get. So they figured they keep it as simple as possible. So the short form really just contained basic demographic information. How many people live in this place? What are their, what is their age, their sex, and their race? Pretty much that was it. That's why it's called the short form. It was just a few questions, trying to get some of those basic details down. Hmm? Yes. But, you know, for all kinds of policy making and research, uh, you know, the Census Bureau also wants to collect much more detailed information about American communities, like their socioeconomic statuses, so things like their earnings, um, their <coughs> rent, their educational attainment, um, their status in the labor force, um, their commuting time, so many things the, Ameri the Census Bureau wants to get information about so that you know people can make decisions and do analysis and stuff like that. So that those questions were put into the long form. And it was long because it was longer. <laughs> it was called the long form because it was longer. And it, could, it had questions about all these very specific things. Now, because that was like a time-consuming form, that was not sent to every single American household. That was sent to a sample of the population. Um, so I think it was like one in seven households maybe received the long form. Can I say any criteria? Like each household? Oh, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. Can it just be random? Like I, I guess. The statistical? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes. The mathematician speaks up. Yes. It <laughs> should, it should yeah. probably, yes. Mm -hmm. It probably was random. But yeah, but I would, uh, we can look into that I, uh, to make sure. But okay. So one in seven, something like that. Don't quote me on that one, maybe. But uh, I think so. And um, so the long form took this detailed socioeconomic information. Now, then they decided after 2000-ish that to start a new methodology because what they decided was that these, this information was only taken every 10 years. So these, all these censuses, they're called decennial censuses. The first one was 1790, the second one was 1800, the third one was 1810. They realized that we, the American country and communities, were changing at uh, too fast of a rate for this decennial census business. Like they wanted more information more quickly than that. So they decided to just completely change the method of the census. And um, basically, the uh, they introduced something called the American Community Survey, which is a survey that is. Um, uh, sent out actually yearly, so not every 10 years, but yearly, but it is sent to a much smaller number of people than, um, the, than that long form was. So something like, I think, one in 40 households, um, about 3.5 million people, I think, per year receive the American Community Survey questions. 3.5 million. Um, and maybe that's, that's probably 3.5 million households. I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, so, um, and that, but that information then 
in this much smaller sample, so a much smaller sample, since you guys are all pretty like numerically oriented, a much smaller sample is going to have more error associated with it, right? So, and, um, but anyway, at the same time, it's, um, it, uh, pr it gives researchers this information on a yearly basis, um, which, you know, was the big advantage of it. I have a question. Great. Yeah. Are the number of replies also the same number that they give out, that they send out to the students? Oh. Well, clearly it's not. Clearly not, but um, but I guess they try for that because they do say that you know it's like your lawful responsibility. <coughs> it's, it's 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 illegal not to respond. Interesting. Okay. I mean, I don't know what kinds of repercussions there are if you don't, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's you know. It's the most indirect, coercive way, I guess, to to uh, complete the survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Okay. No. Great. Great question. Um, okay. So the so the so the ACS was introduced in two thousand. The first ACS was introduced in two thousand five. I'm pretty sure. But um, but I just like to make the point though that the decennial census asking all that basic demographic information every ten years that's just distributed to everyone is still alive. So the short form and the decennial census, and which attempts to be a full count, so not a sample, a full count, um, still takes place every 10 years. Okay. Um, so this is like this great article that I read about this that helped me understand it a little bit more. Um, it was by a Cornell professor named Joe Francis, and uh, it says, long live the American community, there is a beloved long form and stay. Um, and that was when they made this giant, you know, this was really a big shift in the, in the, the way the census collected and distributed data. Um, and uh, anyway, so we'll get into that at some other point, but that's just a little preview of that kind of thing because it's kind of interesting, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, as mentioned, census data is nationwide, but New York City, um, being the cool place that it is, um, has its own portal of census information specifically for New York, which is what we're going to focus on um, for this lab at least. Um, so basically, uh, the New York City Census Fact Finder looks like this. It's um, also an interactive map, and um, you know, you search for your address like this, um, I'm not going to do it because you'll do it for the lab, um, but um, you'll see that there are two tabs of information um, that should be familiar to you now that from the previous slide. And that's all I'm going to say because I don't want to hold your hand too much through this. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that. And I guess that's it. Questions? So those are all the data portals you guys are going to get into for a specific building in New York, and uh, you're going to learn a lot about that building. And but it, it's uh, yeah, the, um, it should be interesting hopefully. So pick a building that you really have an interest in because you're going to be learning about it in all these different dimensions. No, no, it doesn't have to be historical. No. Um, so you might want to spend a little time, like Malik did this yesterday, he spent a little time kind of figuring out what building he wanted to do. He searched around for a little bit, thought about it, so take your time to figure that out. Um, the lab is available, um, um, is available where it usually is, in the weekly assignments folder, um, under week three, lab assignment three. Um, and here it is, so pick a property and getting to know the landscape of New York City open data is what we're calling the lab. And um, yeah. Can I use where I live? Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. As long as it's in the five boroughs. Okay. Any questions?